Hi everyone, welcome to my series on this book, Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby by Sandy Metz. What I'd like to do is make a video for each chapter going over what gets covered in each and explaining the concepts. I found this book to be exceptionally helpful as I've been learning Ruby and what are the best practices. And I think that it's uh, that making these videos be a, a good opportunity to pass on some of what I've learned um, to you. So, um, like I said, it was, this will be a tutorial summary of each of the chapters. Um, the book is by Sandy Metz. I definitely recommend picking it up um, once you've gotten a little bit of knowledge of Ruby and want to get to the next level of now that you know how to write methods and classes and uh, kind of the, the basics, then how do you take that knowledge and make stuff in the real world with it? That's kind of what this what this book covers. So chapter one is called Object Oriented Design, and it's an in introduction to the paradigm of object oriented design in programming languages. And it just so happens that the the language used in this book is Ruby, but the the paradigm applies to a lot of modern languages. So what is object oriented design? And basically what it is, is it thinks of the world as a bunch of objects, like, you know, I am a person object, I'm recording on a device that is a laptop object. And so the world is full of objects, and they all communicate with each other via messages, and they have states and behaviors, like, for example, the state of the laptop object is turned on, the state of me is... I'm alive, things like that. So why object-oriented programming as opposed to procedural or some other paradigm that exists out in the world of programming languages? So Sandy talks about the, the virtue of being future-proof and that becomes a huge, huge cornerstone of object-oriented design. And basically what that entails is or it, it means like when you store states and behaviors and attributes and you define messages really explicitly within the context of an object as opposed to procedurally or functionally as you see in other languages, in the future when you need to change something, which will definitely happen, and when the time comes, you can target that one class or that one method and make the change that, that you need and not have to worry as much as you would in other languages how that change will affect the rest of the program. And so the, the technical term for what I just described um, is called managing dependencies. And that is basic, it basically means you minimize the amount of interaction that classes have between each other. And, and we'll, we'll like look at that in much, much more in depth, so if that doesn't make sense at the moment, um, don't worry about it. So design itself is the arrangement of the objects and their interaction, and really the rest of the book is dedicated to showing how to do that in the best way, quote unquote. The best way meaning it's the most logical, the most readable by other programmers, the most reusable in the future, um, the one that will hopefully cause you the least amount of headaches as you're writing it now, let alone in the future, and minimizing what has to be changed in the long run. So there are kind of five broad principles, and I'm just going to run over these pretty quickly. Um, they all show up in, they all show up much more in depth further on in the book, and so if it just sounds like buzzwords right now, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to it in later videos. So there's an acronym, SOLID, S-O-L-I-D. The S stands for single responsibility. O stands for open closed. L is for Liskov substitution. I, interface segregation. D, dependency inversion. And then outside of that acronym, there's the law of Demeter and the principle of not repeating yourself. The act of design itself, when you're just setting out to make your program, it's, it's a very difficult thing. It's, it's very difficult 
because even though there are well-defined principles and patterns associated with what what are the best practices to do in a given situation, um, it's hard because you don't have a clear picture of what the end result needs to be necessarily. You might have like a very high high level view, but the the level of granularity required to get from having an idea to actually having a finished product is just immensely more complex than you could foresee in the very beginning. Luckily this book is here to illuminate that process and give your give your mind an idea of how it should go about breaking down a problem and then constructing what objects will eventually make up the program. Design and programming are pretty inextricably intertwined because design is a process of discovering what your program needs to be eventually and programming ex itself is what powers that discovery process and so by sitting down and writing out a method for example by by hitting your idea at that level of granularity you are able to figure out what's possible and what's best at the macro level of the design of the program itself. And so design and programming inform each other. There are a lot of things that design is judged on and we've talked about a couple of them already like reusability and future-proofness and managing dependencies and whatnot. Um, but it's also in an, in an even broader sense than those is, is a question of how how much output do you get for an amount of input so you, so before you even start programming you have to ask yourself how long will it take to design this feature to implement it and then to start reaping the benefits of it and you might find that there are some things that are just not worth putting in your program because they'll take a long time to do or they might not give you much output ultimately and then on the flip side Doing this sort of self-assessment early on in the programming process will help you identify which ones you can hit more quickly and which ones you should prioritize because they'll give you more output sooner and basically be cost-effective for your time. That's about it for the Chapter 1 summary. This was very high level and very abstract, so if it all seems kind of foreign to you, don't worry about it. We will definitely get into the nitty gritty and start doing examples in chapter two. And I want to just say quickly in closing that the concepts of this book are not, they're, they're on the beginner end of things, but you definitely need to have some understanding of how the Ruby language works. And I would definitely recommend, if, if you are totally new to Ruby, I would recommend Codecademy's Ruby track. I would recommend the Ruby Monk website. I've had just great experiences um, learning and practicing Ruby through them. And once you have, once you have the basics down, I'll see you in the next video.